Okay. So um, let us start at some point uh, a little bit aside from where we finished, but nevertheless a very fundamental point from my point of view. Uh, for a long while, people have been asking me what are important uh, algorithms. What should they study? And you know, people usually say, "Oh, probably the entire CNUS or you know things like that." And after many many years of thinking, I realized that uh, there are actually three things, three very basic things, which allow me to reason about programming. That if I, I can do these three algorithms, I could do anything else. And uh, they are not a very difficult things, seemingly. At least most of us have some idea what they are. The algorithms are swap minimum and maximum they, they connect, and linear search. But uh, in reality, they are much, much harder than people think. It, is, it took me decades uh, to get them half right, uh, you know. And uh, there are people who are quite distinguished who actually cannot get them right or actually even deny their existence. The most famous programmer at Google, used to be the most program, famous programmer in this building, used to tell me that he never needed to do swap. That swap is just an invention, and no code uh, you need, you need to, to use it. So, well, to each his own. Uh, again, let us see how these things, how these things relate to theories which we are talking about. Why do I think that swap is fundamental? Because when I think about swap, when I try to think what swap means, the meaning of swap, I have to deal with things like copy, assignment, and then equality. Because again, what does it mean? I swap two things. I, it means that I make the thing on the left to be equal to whatever used to be on the right in the other way around. That's the meaning of swapping. And there is, again, a theory of swappable things. As we shall see on the next slide, I'm always confused, as you know, with, with slides. On the next slide, we'll see that the corresponding theory is called the theory of regular types. Then minimum and maximum. Again, a lot of things could be done because they could be ordered. Ordering is one of the fundamental things which allow us to find things fast. That is, theoretically speaking, we do not need ordering, but imagine using a phone directory which is not ordered. I mean, it is indeed very useless, unless you have lots of time. Uh, and finally, linear search which is very useful for unordered phone directory. Again, you could go and find things. So that if we could figure that out, we obtain three fundamental concepts, three, fu three fundamental theories which underlie daily programming. Again, regular and related notion of semi-regular, where maybe equality is not explicitly defined, but nevertheless it exists. Then total ordering and something related to it called weak ordering. Again, not to be confused under any circumstances with partial ordering. Uh, one of my disciples in his book, when he defines max and min, says that it, they require partial ordering. Well, he is very wrong. If you have partial ordering, indeed, you cannot do min and max. So, while well, you have weak ordering, you do. Again, 
I am not going to talk about ordering in this journey. If we live long enough, if we come back, for those of you who missed the beginning of the class, there will be some delay with the course. I am sent in back into the trenches to, to defend the motherland, and when I come from the trenches, we'll resume the course. So, uh, and if we resume the course, or when we resume the course, we will learn a little bit more about total ordering and weak ordering. Those of you who want to learn about them ahead of time, there's this great book called Elements of Programming. And for those of you, I think you know that. And finally, iterator concepts. The concept of iterator. So these are three fundamental theories. Again, people tend to get confused. They think, no, no, you need some complicated stuff. As a matter of fact, you don't. This is, this is a very typical confusion. If you understand very well basic things, you could do a lot. So again, it's hard. I remember when I did STL, I was at that time at HP Labs. And one of the clever people uh, comes to me and says, well, this is nothing. Anybody could do lists and vectors. If you did octal trees, that would be impressive. So I should have produced a library which contained one data structure called octal tree, according to him. And then it would be truly useful. Uh, so again, but in reality, simple things are things which matter. And again, this, now we're talking about this iterator theories. These are theories, fundamentally theories of successor, this piano-based theories. So let us look at what kind of iterator theories we have. We have the, this is sort of the main, the main line. We have, let's start with forward iterators. Let's ignore input iterators for a second. Forward iterators are iterators which allow you to go forward. You know, anybody who ever implemented or used a singly linked list should be familiar with such iteration. You could go forward. You cannot come backwards. You cannot uncar for Lisp knowing that. I mean, you go forward. There is no step. There is no backward pointer. Right? And you could go till you reach some end, whether it's nil whether it is some node in the middle, you could go and you could pass through this list how many times? As many as you like. Again, the successor function, in other words, unless something happens, is regular. That is, the successor of something always remains the same. Well, you say, what about reflective? I know about reflect, but assume that as long as there are no modifications of the list, you always go to the same place. Then there are bidirectional iterators. What is mathematical meaning of bidirectional iterators? The mathematical meaning is that successor is an invertible function. If you could have successor, you could have predecessor, and though there is only one predecessor. If somebody has a successor, successor then has a predecessor. Right? Observe that. I'm not saying that everybody has a predecessor. The first guy might not have a predecessor. But if you have a successor, then your successor has a predecessor. Again, by directionality, what you could do, you could go back and forth. For example, it's very easy, if you remember what we did at the end of journey two, to implement, say, reverse. You could go like that while swapping things. It's much harder to implement reverse when you could go only forward. And then finally, random access. The idea is that what happens is that you could suddenly jump and not just jump far, but jump fast. Right? That is, doing three steps in some sense is as take you as much time as doing one step. It's 
very nice. So there are many algorithms which could be done in this framework cannot be normally done uh, with forward and bidirectional interactors. So by the way, when I started working on, on this stuff, which was many, many years ago, uh, I obviously saw only these three things. They were natural, right? And then I realized something. I realized that large body of algorithms which resided here resided with forward iterators, didn't really need forward iterators, meaning it could work on weaker theory. This, for example, I realized that if I look for something, I'm not just going only in one direction, but I'm going through this only once. That is, I realized that there are classes of algorithms which are single-pass algorithms. Right? The, there is a difference between forward-pass and single-pass, because when I pass forward, I could go many times. If it's single-pass, I am not allowed to say, well, there are no data structures like that. Or yes, there are. For example, if you think about data coming through a wire, that's a perfect mo model of an input iterator. I mean, you could read it, but you could read it only once. It is gone. All kind of streams represent this notion of input iterator. You could go forward, but after you make the step, whatever you were is gone. It cannot be retrieved. So, and apparently very many algorithms could be done in terms of input iterator, not just find it. For example, a very simple but very, very important algorithm known as merge. You know, some of you in search might have even heard of merge. So how do you do merge? You take two streams and you go through outputting sort of, but you never, you never need to go through the same thing twice. It works with input iterators, right? intersection, union, all such theoretical algorithms, interestingly enough, work in this very weak framework. So, and then finally, there's somewhat weird iterators called output iterators. Uh, sort of again, when I was starting, and in terms of strictly, if I were impractical guy, well, some people claim I'm terribly impractical guy, but uh, if I were truly impractical guy, I would just define forward bidirectional and random access iterators. But being practical guy, I realized that there is a dual thing to input iterators. As we have input streams, there are also output streams. For example, a natural way of writing merge is to take stuff from two input streams and put things into output streams. So output iterators are funny iterators. They're very, very weak. But they allow you to model output streams. They actually do work with output streams. Okay? Uh, they cannot be dereferenced. You cannot read. You know, if you have an output pipe, you couldn't get stuff out of it. It's just not accessible. Okay, and uh, obviously there is no way to compare equality of values because you couldn't even get values. So it's not. Right. There are other iterators. Again, there is this great man Alexandrescu, you know of him, who goes around saying iterators are evil, need to be abolished, and because there are only three kinds or whatever. Well, of course, he's wrong, as he's wrong just about everything he says. Uh, in specifically, there are many other classes of iterators. The fact that they're not defined in the standard doesn't mean that theories do not exist or are not useful. Okay? For example, they're extremely, they're just a couple of examples. One of them elaborated very carefully in EOP, the notion of linked iterators. These are iterators which allow successor to be mutable. There are data structures, singly linked lists, 
very good example, where you could change a successor. You know, today, Jack points to Ryan, then he gets tired and starts pointing to Paul. I mean, he changes his successor. Again, those of you who used Lisp, the corresponding iteration is called, called Biplagdi. Those of you who use Scheme, the younger generation, is called Set Kuda. You know, it's, I mean, it's well, well understood iteration. And actually, you could have a very elegant theory which describes, describes it. Again, it is an element of programming. There is another example of segmented iterators which should have been in the standard, but for some historical reasons, they are not. For example, there is a data structure in the standard called DEC, of which I was quite proud, uh, which is segmented array, provides you random access, but never requires full reallocation like a vector. But uh, right now, because of the situation of with powerful international bodies called standard committees, uh, it has only one iterator which goes through the whole thing. But if you think how the segmented data structures work, it should have two level iterators. You should have big heavy iterator which could go through the whole thing. And then at every step, it has to check if it jumps segments. But it should have a different iterator, a small lightweight iterator, of which you know that it points inside a segment where you could traverse one bucket, one segment, quickly. Right? And there are typical algorithms which work on the segmented iterators. For example, instead of doing copy going through the whole big iterator, you do copy by obtaining segment by segment and outputting segment with the lightweight iterator. Right? It's sort of technique which has been around for decades, but unfortunately not in the standard. But of course, it is, in a sense, it is logically there. So segmented iterator need to be studied. Uh, we plan to put a chapter in elements of programming, but we didn't. It sort of didn't work. When you write books, there are all kinds of considerations, what fit and what doesn't fit. But, uh, so there are very many, in general, sort of, it, what are iterators? Iterators are these coordinate structures, things which point to something else. And they have traversal methods. And there could be wonderfully many of them. Again, it's not that you could just not stay with the ones which I defined. You need to study more and more and more. OK. Simple example of a function, simplest function, uh, which works for uh, even input iterator. It's called distance. That's how you find a distance between two different positions. Well, you start with 0. And then you go, while they do not become equal, incrementing first and incrementing the count. When they become equal, you output the count. There are a whole bunch of stuff here which seems which needs explanation. This is actually, again, the, probably the simplest possible algorithm for iterators, finding a distance between two points. But even that requires a whole bunch of things. For example, it requires you to understand what a difference type is. Again, a difference type, it's an example. We mentioned it before. It's an example of a type function. For any iterator type, there is, exists an integral type which is big enough to encode distances between iterators. You say, is that like pointed if t or size t? Yes, it is, except it depends on the iterator. It's not absolute. You know, some iterators could be take short as its distance type, some iterators, because you know the ranges are never going to be greater than whatever your short is. Or some iterators could require big num because you know they're that big. So Again, 
here we, we just use the notion of difference type. Then we do something mysterious when we pass in iterator tag. Let us just keep it for as a mysterious thing for about five minutes. We will see shortly. Then we write a precondition saying which is valid range and saying how do you implement it? Oh, well, that's another mysterious thing of which we will talk in a few minutes. But it's nevertheless, it is a precondition. If the range is not valid, the thing will not work. What, what is the meaning of valid range? Let's distinguish implementation from a meaning. The meaning is very simple. The range is valid if you could get from its beginning to its end by doing successor. Say, well, why couldn't you implement it? We will see in a second. So, uh, okay, so this is another implementation of the same function. Remember, we have different theories. We have a theory which is input, forward, bidirectional, and random access. The, the random access thing, what is its natural model of random access? Algorithm. What do we need to think about? Again, as we said here, the model of it is an array. Or the model of iterator is a pointer, normal pointer. So when you have two pointers, you typically don't need to count from one to the other. It's not a linear time algorithm. It is actually a constant time thing. It is, we require that for random access iterators, there is an operation defined called minus, which is a constant time operation. That's, that's a requirement. So that you could subtract it, and you get back uh, an integer type of your difference type. By the way, for a valid range, this has to be non-negative. Last should be greater than, greater equal than, than first. So what we do, we define this distance as a different function. We overload on this thing, which is this mysterious thing, iterator tag. So. Uh, let us, we will see in a second what is the whole point of all of this. First of all, now the formal definition of difference type. Difference type of iterator is an integral type that is large enough to encode elements of any range of that type. Right? Again, you have, to, you have to think what it is when you design, design your stuff. But how do we get it? And here we're getting to something which, uh, which starts logical and beautiful, but then gets into linguistic ugliness. So there are things, iterator traits. Iterator traits are all types affiliated with an iterator type. And there are a whole bunch of them. Observe. There is value type. When you iterate a type, we need to know who lives down there. It is value type. Otherwise, we couldn't write code very hard. Well, then you want to know what's the reference. What's the, I mean, it's for, now you don't use it. You might in the future. You did in the past. When you were young or before you were born, there was, well, not Tom was around. There was a, a company called Intel, which had multiple pointer types and multiple reference types. Pointers ca came like pointer, tiny pointer, long pointer, huge pointer, and they had different semantics. Like long was the same time as huge, but had different semantics. Like uh, but long and huge were 32-bit pointers. But when you incremented one, 
in the long, it would rotate on a 16-bit boundary. Don't look at me. I, was, I didn't do it. <laughs> and for huge, it will go the full, full thing. Uh, segmented architecture, that, that's what they had. And it was much more difficult to do full 32 bits. So they said, we will give you 32 bit, but please don't iterate for more than 16 bit quantities. They were long. So since that's what existed, uh, I had to provide a language facility. It was delegated literally to me to incorporate into C++ all these beautiful things. And, you know, I did it. And, uh, uh, you know, am I proud of it? No, it's not my proudest accomplishment, but I had to do it, I mean, you know, because, you know, at that time, opposing Intel, well, even today, opposing Intel probably is not a good thing. But at that time, it, was, it would have been deadly. And since Microsoft already wanted me dead, sort of if it were Microsoft and Intel. Um, so that's reference and pointer. These are the types which tells you what kind of a pointer type or reference type corresponds to your iterator. Nowadays, it's, it's you t typically just, uh, you know, if this is T value type, then reference is going to be T ref, and this is going to be T star. There are people who threaten, threaten us eventually to produce um, persistent memories. And then there would be different types again. But it has been happening for the last 15 years without any results. So, uh, well, difference type is, you know what? And then finally, there is a type called iterator category. And that's, again, part of the trickery. You see, my goal was to assure that algorithms run as fast as possible, depending on to which theory they belong, whether they're forward or input, or whether they're random access. So the idea is, how do you make it that different pieces of code are called depending on which theory is satisfied. And for that, I came up with this idea, which I thought would be abolished within months. Because people will just say, well, we will specify concepts. And this conceptual hierarchy will direct the algorithm. Well, it's still happening. So you know, after 20 years, there is no, no progress. And this is viewed as the correct mechanism. So. This is an example. You know, remember, when you write a hack, it's very possible that it will live for centuries. And people will study this hack and say how wonderful it is, and stuff like that. So what is iterator category? Iterator category is a type which encodes the theory, which is there are four types. There is a type called input iterator tag. It's a type. There is a type called forward iterator tag, bidirectional iterator tag, and uh, random access iterator tag. So when we call an algorithm, we pass an object of that type to it, and then overloading selects the right function. It's, it's compile time switch statement right, based on types. Again, what are these objects? These objects are vacuous objects. They have no information. They have only type. These are null objects containing type. This is, again, one of these language, language things. So uh, and then, for example, to get to uh, difference type. So I typically write difference type of x, but in order for me to do that, you have to have the following macro. You have to say define difference type of x, type name std 
iterated rate of angle bracket x colon colon difference time. And it will work. Uh, I'm not going to explain to you why and how it works. You're not going to understand anyways, and you shouldn't. In the sense, this is one of these language uh, aberrations. Sort of, there is some mechanism, uh, very silly, but it works. It works very well. Syridium. Yes. So uh, this is this is what what works. But effectively, it is a, the way you do type functions. Now, how do you do category dispatch? How do you assure that every algorithm works as fast as it could? Right? That is, there is no runtime penalty at all. What you do at the very top level, you write a guy called distance. And what does it do? It calls distance with the same two arguments. And then iterate a category of I open paren close paren, which is iterate a category of I gives you a type. But you see, functions don't take types. They take objects. So you need to create an object of that type, which you pass along, and then the dispatch. So in other words, the algorithm will do the correct thing. Is this technique useful? Yes, it's actually very useful even for your code. That is, you could, depending on which data structure or whatever you do you use, you could dispatch, I mean, it does effectively say, couldn't you do it with inheritance and virtues? Yes, you can at runtime. This is done at compile time, right? And it is in line. This is, you, you, you could do dispatch, which sort of one instruction thing at compile time. You could do plus here, minus there, without any virtual functions called virtual functions are expensive function calls are expensive plus is very inexpensive so trading plus for function call is not something you want to do so now remember there was a deferred thing why couldn't i implement valid range and there are of course self evident thing that well or maybe self evident thing that uh, you cannot do it for linked lists. Just imagine, I mean, I do give you two con cells. Do you know that they connect? You don't know. There's no way of finding out because, well, you could keep marching forever. You know, one of them could be in a s one circle, another one, another. You keep marching, you don't know, you'll never find out. It's very hard. Right? It's just, you know, no, no way of finding out. Moreover, the paradoxical thing which, thing, which is not commonly known, even if you deal with simple pointers in C, you cannot do it. Because people say, no, 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 but I could always determine which pointer is larger. No, C does not guarantee you that. C guarantees only the following thing, that if you have two pointers to the same array, you could compare them with less than operation. Which means if you have a valid range, you could check whether it's a valid range. Do, do you see circularity? You cannot, if these are two pointers to different arrays, the range, of course, is not valid, but less than operation is officially undefined. Of course, let me be honest. On any reasonable computer, it will be defined and work. But it's not guaranteed. It's, the computer is allowed to melt if, if you do that. It is the, well, for sure, you cannot rely that one and the other are going to be less than or greater than because a race could move from run to run and do. Well, for sure, if they keep allocated. Uh, so there is no, so how do we live with that? How could we, I mean, we say we write code which depends on a precondition which we cannot check. Ah, but we can, except we do not check it 
at run time. We check it at the design time. Which is there are, again, how do we do it? Because we have some wonderful axioms. We have two axioms which allow us to guarantee validity of ranges. It is one axiom. Again, here we, we suddenly go from all this you know, low-level program back to axioms, but it's, that's how it is. Sort of how do we know the ranges are valid? Well, first of all, there is a general axiom schema for all STL and conforming containers. If you ever want to design a container, you have to guarantee this axiom. that for every container, for a vector, for a list, for a set, for a hash map, any other, for segmented future vector being designed by Jack, whatever, you know, this is the axiom which needs to be guaranteed. That is, if you obtain beginning of the container and end of the container, that's a valid range. You could march from the beginning to the end. That is one thing. So you know that every code which obtains something like that, and those of you who wrote STLI code, you know you frequently do that. That's where you get a teratus from. But then there is a second axiom. Sort of, this is very much like piano. I mean, it's, it's an inductive, it's an inductive pair of axioms. Let us assume that x, y is a valid range. And let's assume that you're not at the end. That's not an empty range. Then we guarantee that the successor of x, comma y, is a valid range. If it's a non-empty range, you could make one step and the validity remains. Right? Which actually allows us, this two axiom, allows us to prove correctness of all of our algorithms. Because when we go back to our dear distance, how do we know? We say, oh, it was valid. Therefore, we check that. Therefore, we could increment it, and it remains valid. Do, do, do you see the logic? Sort of, therefore, the validity of range remains as long as this is the pattern. Again, here there is a discussion about you know, whether we could prove algorithms correct. Of course, we can, and we must. And you know, I personally proved, in case of STL, every single algorithm correct. A whole bunch of them. Could it be done? Yes. Later on, it was done by my friend Dave Masser and his students, actually, mechanically. I didn't do mechanical proof. Uh, I did a mechanical device known as a pencil. Works very well. But, uh, you know, Dave and his students actually ran it and did then Sibylla Schupp, and when she was in Sweden, uh, did that. So multiple people actually proved correctness, which is very good, by, by the way. It's, so you could do it for practical algorithms. And again, what you do, you do basically inductive proof using this, this action, which I, I, I showed you. Sometimes it's a little bit trickier, like in case of merge, because you have two guys. So you have to, to but well, it's tricky. It takes three minutes instead of one minute to prove. They, they're not, very few algorithms I encountered are difficult to prove. There are some. There is sort of tree rotation algorithm and elements of programming, which is indeed tricky to prove. You have to use some. But uh, most, most algorithms require simple inductive reasoning, wh which actually works. There is another sort of important algorithm called advanced. Again, you start someplace and you could go n steps. What does it take? It's done by advance is a extended version of plus plus. Right? Plus plus moves you one step. Advance is a sort of thing which will move you n steps. 
And uh, again, it takes difference type. You could advance only by that much. And if it's input iterator, forward iterator, so on, you have to do the loop, while loop. If it is random access iterator, you do just this. So when you write code, was there a bug? I don't see. Uh, it's supposed to say random access iterator, guys. This is known as uh, uh, cut and paste. But also, you realize that compiler doesn't see it. Because for both of them, these are just defined to not defined, not typed. Defines type, defined to type name, yes, so the same type name. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, again, if we do category dispatch, a fast advance will happen. We'll see an example soon of how, how it allows us to do things very nicely. Now, so we have ranges, very quick sort of reminder what kind of ranges exist. Open range, open interval, means neither I or J belong. Sort of, it's elements inside, strictly inside. Semi-open, closed. There's also backward semi-open range. Round and then bracket. Uh, they never come, they never happen, but they do exist. Mm, sort of, theoretically. Uh, there is a remarkable fact that algorithmically semi-open ranges are right. They allow us to do everything correctly. Okay. They are superior. Let us prove it, their superiority. Okay. There are, I listed a bunch of things which you, you know, you heard of. Search. So it's much easier easier to design an interface for search if you have a semi-open range. Why? Because you see if you have, say, three guys, the results of search are how many? No. He thought if you have three guys, the results will be three. No. If I'm searching, I have Ryan, Jack, and Paul. You see them? Three guys. And I'm searching for Tom amongst them. It's not going to be. There is something else. There is one invisible guy which I need. I need four guys to define the results of the search in a sequence of three elements. Because I could find first, I could find second, I could find third, or I can not find. That is, I need one more iterator to deal with three elements. Now, you say, well, it's just such. Other guys are not like, no, guys, it's everywhere. Now, let's think about insert. L let's look here. You see, Ryan, Jack, Paul. How many insertion points do we have? Four insertion points. We could insert here. Here, here, and here. Again, one more than them. We need one more iterator for insertion. No, it's four, not five. Well, you are not insert. <laughs> That's what we're talking about with mathematical insert. Right? When a location fails, exception happens, or computer melts. No, it goes here here, here, and here. Mathematic, think about mathematical problem. Don't think about, okay, what if the power is down? <laughs> so, I, mean, I don't know. But there are four outcomes. If I have a sequence A, B, C, and I'm inserting D, there are four places. It could be D, A, B, C, A, D, B, C. Do I have to go through? Four, four possibilities when we do insert. A rotation. I want 
to rotate these guys around. How many rotations do we have? Four rotations. I could because identity is a rotation as well. One, two, uh, For three and three and zero. Maybe I like it. Uh, okay. Ignore rotation. Okay. Ignore rotation. Ignore rotation. No, you cannot ignore rotation. Two of them, there are four, two of them are identical. But just in any case, let's look at partition. I want to partition them, you know, into good guys, bad guys. How many partitioning are there? Again, four. It could be. All of them are good. Only Ryan is good. That's what Ryan thinks. Uh, Jack and Ryan are good. That's what Jack and Ryan think. Uh, or all. Three of them are good, but you know, there are also a possibility. None of them are good. Uh, it is a possibility. Uh, so, you know, in order to the general thing that there are in a sequence of n elements. Isn't there five partitions though? They all could be bad, so that's the same thing. In some sense. No. There could be all of them are bad. Ryan is good. Jack is good. And Ryan are good. And all three of them are good. And what about this? No, no, no. We, we're partitioning, we're partitioning sort of in a sequence, a monotonic sequence. So a sequence of n elements has n plus 1 positions. That's the. the the basic thing is this position, this position, this position, and this position. Right? For example, well, I mean, people who designed computer editors, you know about VI? How many of you? Know? Some of you. Use. Remember, there is a notion of what is called the cur cursor in VI. And the cursor has, if you have n characters in the buffer, VI has n plus 1 cursor positions. You could move cursor behind after the last position. It's not, it's not an aberration. It's this mathematical necessity. So this is why semi-open ranges is the correct thing for most algorithms. Right? And you know, it's, it takes long, long time to, to observe it. But I am doing it long, long time now, 40 years. So trust me, I mean, they are much, much better. Break. We get back at 11.